Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to our second episode of Formit Friday. This is Tom Villaro, product manager for Formit, and we have on the line Tobias Hawthorne. Hello there. Good morning. I am calling from sunny Atlanta, visiting the campus of Georgia Tech today, and kind of meeting with some faculty to hear about Formit. Uh, we're going to do a, a little bit more of a deeper dive here, I'll turn on the camera, into some of the modeling tools um, that we sort of teased out from the last episode. Uh, before we get into that, I wanted to just kind of uh, point everyone towards uh, the blog. And we did a recap blog post and posted the video from the first episode on our new YouTube channel. So if you go to format. 360.autodesk.com, and we can talk about that a little bit later. We have a little bit of a name change going on. Um, then if you go to our blog, you can see we'll have the video and uh, some images from the last episode. And if you missed it from earlier last month, we also have a, a little video of our April 1st joke, which was form it on the Apple Watch. So as the Apple Watch is launching, I think today, I thought I would show this again. So just to be clear, we are not putting form it on the Apple Watch. <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a joke, but maybe someday, maybe someday. We'll see how, we'll see how that evolves. Um, OK, so I think I will, without any further ado, I will hand it over to Tobias, and I just want to let everyone know that you can post questions in the GoToWebinar question pane on the right. Uh, post questions anytime during this, and we will uh, follow up with those questions either during the webinar or soon afterwards. All right. So happy Friday, everybody. Uh, thanks for attending again. It's just scrolled through the list of names that are attending, and it's great to see a lot of the people who've been following Formit for a while, and uh, some new names on there too as well. So uh, it's great to be talking to you on Friday. Um, Tom, can you see my screen all right? I can. The Firefox browser? OK, great. So um, yeah, I wanted to uh, recap just a little bit from last week. Um, Googling Formit brings up our, our website that Tom was just showing you. And then the second option there is to actually launch the Formit website. Um, so. I went ahead and did that already, so I've got the session ready to go. And I'm in a Firefox browser today instead of a Chrome browser. Um, both of those work for Format Web. Um, Internet Explorer doesn't really work that well, and Safari does work, um, but we're not testing on it as often as we're testing on Firefox and Chrome. So I wanted to use Firefox today. Um, the performance is really fast on Firefox. They do some really nice browser optimizations. So it's tending to be my uh, browser of choice recently. Um, and I wanted to start off kind of where we left off last week. And that was with that live or kind of school file that we were building. Um, and one thing I wanted to show with um, Format Web is that you can save your format files on your desktop, you don't necessarily have to save them in your A360 account. Um, if you've got them saved on your desktop, you can come to the Import button and choose to Import 3D Model. And when you do that, um, I'll go to my desktop where I believe that I stored this. Oh, I guess I didn't. So I'll go to my Box folder, go to my Format folder, go to my Presentations folder, and go to my Format Webinars, Episode 1. All right, so I've got my AXM file stored there. And I'll just click to open that. And it loads super fast and brings in the um, satellite image with it. So this is basically where we left off last week. Uh, and what I wanted to kind of go back to is right at the end of the session, we were doing some geometry modifications here to this piece. And when I pulled that face, um, and actually, let me take a step back just for everybody who wasn't here last week. Essentially, we've got a handful of geometry that has levels applied to it. And these have been grouped and then arrayed to where if I edit one of these by double clicking to edit the group and then grab an edge and drag it up, um, it's going to affect all of those. And we did the same thing. I'll double click 
outside of any geometry and then I'll exit edit group mode. And we did the same thing to these bodies over here on this side. So what I'm going to do is kind of go back and tweak these. And this is what I was saying. Uh, at the end of the last session, I did a tilt face on this and ended up making the face uh, faceted. So it's no longer planar there. And you, we hide those faceted curves, those faceted edges at certain um, tolerances. So if it's a shallow angle, then we don't actually show that. But you can bring that back just by right clicking and there's a button here on the context menu that will facet the face so you can see those. And I don't know about you, for me, those are kind of ugly. I want to go back in and fix that geometry. So I want to show you a quick trick to do that. Um, this is one of the things I showed last week that you can draw a line um, from that corner and then come across this way, do a shift lock so that you make sure you stay on that axis. And then when you hit that edge, you've got this face up here. And now you can essentially wipe that out, just kind of drag that face out and remove that geometry. So now you've got a nice flat surface on top. And you can do the same thing along the front face here. This is a cool inferencing trick. If you get that corner right there, click to start, go straight up, shift lock so that you're locked on that axis. And then when you get to the top face, you get this blue diamond. That means you're on the face. And if you click there, oops, shift lock on the blue there you go and then click you're going to have that point straight up and be on that face so then you can come off at that that axis and oops and go ahead and click and then you can come back across that face too and go ahead and click and this allows you to now click that face and just drag it straight down and wipe it off the front too so now you've got um your, your volume is back to uh, normal. And you can also do this trick where you grab that face and you can pull it out to be in the same plane and you've actually got this L shape back to kind of a normal L shape. Like you don't have to delete it, you can kind of tweak that geometry and get it back to where you wanted. So um, now I wanna show one other pretty sweet modeling tool that's available in our released app. So I'm up here at our released app. I'll go into our development branch later. Um, but I'll click that face then right click and use the offset face tool. And this allows you to specify an offset for all four sides of a face or however many sides of the face you have. So I'll hit tab here and set my offset to five feet. And it's gonna set that for me. And then I can grab that inside face and push that in. Um, and I can, so I think this is one thing I showed last week that we increment this at whole numbers. So this is like 12 foot, 10 foot, 8 foot. If you zoom in a little bit, it'll increment at smaller whole numbers. It's just kind of based on your zoom level. So I'll go to about 5 feet in. And now I've got that kind of shape there. Um, you can go ahead and click this guy and push it down if you wanted to wipe that out. Um, you can also come over here and grab that top face, click to start the drag, and then come over here to inference and pull it down so it's at that height all the way across. All right, so that's offset face, pretty powerful. Um, you can do a lot with that. And then the tilt face command, this is probably the right way to go about um, making this kind of an angled facade. And um, so it's kind of the same interaction. You click to select the face, right click, and then we have this tilt face icon. And when you click that, you get this um, widget that appears and this widget will kind of help you find um, the axis that you want to drag along. So in my case I'm going to grab each of these corners and have the drag axis be um, down here at the bottom. Actually what I'll do then is go ahead and grab that guy. There we go. So grab the red circle, set the axis to be the bottom and then up here at the top now I'll go ahead and click to drag that arrow and pull the face out. And what this does is it keeps the whole face planar. Uh, it adjusts all these edges at the same time that are on this face so that they all stay planar. And that's probably a much better way to go about doing that than dragging an edge or multiple edges. Uh, and you can go ahead and do the same thing for the top face too. So select the top face, right click, tilt face, and the axis is over here, but I want it to be on the other side. So I can grab that red grip, put it on the other side, and then come over here and grab this guy, drag it up a little bit. So now I've got this kind of shape on top of my building. 
And that's just using the regular modeling tools that are there. So what I want to do with groups real fast is um, add louvers into this, into these guys, and um, have a special situation here on the end. So with groups, it's great that you just make the change in one place and they all update. You can see all these updated with it. Um, but then you, you, know, you have that nuanced idiosyncratic case that you want to treat differently. So in this case, I'll go ahead and right click on this particular group and choose this button here that has an asterisk and make it unique. So now this guy is kind of broken off from the rest of these patterns and I can do something different here with him. Um, so if I go ahead and edit this guy, you see these are grayed out, so they're not going to be changed. I can grab that face and push it out. And now it's kind of opened up on that side. I can grab this face and push it back. So now it's totally open, kind of a little um, outdoor patio space there. And now I can go ahead and add like a louver system onto this face. And so this is another technique that's pretty important. It's being able to nest groups inside of groups um, because otherwise you have that kind of sticky geometry problem that we talked about last week. If I were to kind of draw my, um, you know, my rectangle shape out in order to make a louver, and you know, I'm kind of making this on the ground, I'm only going to do a couple of steps here because I, I know I'm doing this wrong. Like if this, this piece of geometry now is stuck to these to this patio, and I actually wanted that to be separate. So the solution for us in Formit is to use grouping. So again, I'll double click this chunk of geometry, uh, right click, use the group button, and now I've created a group within a group. And so now I can keep things separate. So I'll go ahead and start my uh, louver again, draw a rectangle, drag that guy up, hit tab, six inches and now i've got um, my first louver if i double click that guy uh, and right click i'll use the array tool and our array tool has the uh, grouping functionality built into it so if i do array this i've got this checkbox that will try to make a group out of it um, so that we can edit it later um, and in this case i'll go ahead and set this for total length because I'm going to go from the bottom of this patio to the top of that piece. Um, and I'll set it so that I'll have a total of 15 at the end. So I'll go ahead and click that corner and then start going up in the blue axis. I'll do a shift lock so that I don't lose that as I zoom out. And then I'll use inferencing again to line that up with the top of that piece. And then let go, and now I've got these pieces here and they're all grouped so that as I make an edit to one of these, they'll all update. So I can click that face, drag it out a bit further, like so, they all update. I'll orbit around to this side and draw another rectangle here, two feet and down to there. And then grab that face and drag this out along the facade of the building. So now I have kind of a, a nice uh, articulated louver there on the west side of my building. Um, and adding louvers into all these other ones is basically following the same steps. Um, and it's, it'll be easier because they're all one group. So if I edit this guy, select this guy, um, let me do this actually, I'll go ahead and push these all back so that it's the same patio. Double click, hit G, the keyboard shortcut for group, and now I'll go ahead and sketch in uh, the same rectangle here, uh, two feet, oops, let me do tab two feet, and then come out over this way. There we go. And pop that guy up, tab six inches, and grab this guy, um, double click him. So this is, um, I'll use the other type of array here. I do array, and then I'll do a length between two points in this case. And what I want to do is basically um, between that point right there and then start coming up. And what I'll do is hold down shift so it's locked there and then come over to this side so I can get that second point right there. So I know the distance between those louvers. Oops. So I know that the distance between those louvers is the same on both sides. There we go. 
And as I did that in one, they all updated. So now I've got louvers in that patio on all sides. So that's the make unique tool, and that's pretty important um, because otherwise, if you had started to tweak this one corner, all of them would have lost that corner, and maybe that's not really what you wanted. And Tobias, why don't you show, just to reinforce the undo, the differences in terms of undoing within a group versus outside? Yeah, that's a great point. So yeah, our undo behavior with groups is unique um, and powerful, but definitely it takes some, uh, uh, you need to know what's going on with it. So I'm outside of any group right now. I'm out in the main sketch. Now, if I hit undo, it undoes the stuff that I just did over here, which might be confusing because the last edits I was doing were obviously into these groups over here. So the way undo works is it's per group. So if I wanted to undo the changes I did in that group, I need to enter that group. And then there's a second, you see these undo controls are grayed out, but as part of our group, uh, toolbar, we've got an undo control there. And there's also a little helper text here too that undo and redo are per group. So if I undo, then it's going to take steps back inside that group. Um, and it's cool because it actually remembers that throughout your whole session. So um, if there's a change that you made here way back when, and you've already done a bunch of other edits in your model, you don't have to come back and you know delete things. You're actually able to edit that group and make that change right there. Um, like, for instance, uh, these louvers, if I wanted to change their behavior, I can jump back into this and do control Z inside this group, and it'll start to undo the things that I did there. So that's kind of, that's a good one to, uh, to be aware of. All right. Uh, so Tom, are there any questions or anything um, before I jump into the content library? Um, I don't see any questions yet. Okay. Cool. So uh, the content library is a pretty big enhancement that we put into the last release, and um, this gets to be a lot of fun. Um, that basically you can link a library from A360 that you've got stored there, and um, then it, it's just a really easy way to keep a toolbox of materials of your format stuff around with you. So um, it's linked into A360. I'll go ahead and cancel because it's already set there for me. Um, and on your A360 drive uh, location in your documents folder there's uh, a folder called formats and that's where all your format stuff is saved so if you click to open that um, when you link a content library we create a content folder for you so this is the only place where that um, that UI looks in format and when you go into this folder you can create whatever subfolder structure you want um, I've got a folder called Entourage, a folder called Furniture, a folder about Revit Furniture, and other sort of format stuff that I've created. And inside that, you can store your particular files. And these are AXM files. That's the file format associated with format. And um, so you'll see in just a second, I'll load in my materials basic file and some Entourage and trees and stuff like that. Um, so I'll go back over here to my tab. I've got a filter now set up based on those folders that I created. So I'll go to my Entourage folder, and I get a little preview of the file that's there. So I'm going to place my tree silhouette file in the scene. I just click over here in the canvas. Um, it it's, can be a drag and drop or a click and click. Either way, you click that tile and come over here and click to place it. So these are just some tree files that I created ahead of time. Um, you can select them right-click, choose the rotate tool, uh, put that down, and then use the little arrows to rotate these to the angle that you want. Um, and I also took some time and made some scale people. So go ahead and place those guys there. Right-click, go to my rotate tool, and move those guys over too. So it's just a nice way to kind of add some context to your scene and really easy to do. Um, the other piece that I have in here is furniture. And these are, you know, just nice items to add to give some scale to interior scenes if you have any in your in your project. So, so that's, Tobias, we, we did. Sorry, we did have a couple questions. My yeah. uh, question pane was shrunk. I couldn't see. Um, so one question was about dimensions. So uh, Adam is asking if there, when will listening dimensions be available? I want to be able to 
type dimensions as I draw? Yeah, that's a great question. We're working on the developer um, to, to get that in right now. He uh, supported those dimensions in, uh, in, a, in a different product, and so he, uh, he needs some convincing how important it is. So uh, we'll definitely take your feedback, Adam. It's awesome to hear people requesting it because then it makes it a lot easier to make that case. And then um, Ben was asking, is there a way to change units from being foot to inches, or changing from foot? Uh, oh, ch changing from being foot base to inches base, I think, during a dimension editing. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, I think you can do it either way. Um, I'm not 100% sure, so this is kind of like trying in the blind. But as you're dragging this, you know, it's in feet right now. So if I hit tab to go into it, I think that I can just type 12 and then the inches symbol, and it'll only move yeah. one foot. So. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. Like maybe you want the default to be inches as opposed to feet, but and we don't have a way to, to turn that. Um, yeah, the way we have it now is it's relative, I think, to your zoom factor. So I think if do you if you zoom in really close, will it? Oh yeah, good point. So if I grab this guy and then yeah, it looks like it does do inches at that point. It'll, it, it's kind of adaptive to the um, zoom factor that you're in. Um, and then there was a couple other questions about will we, will we be showing iOS and Android versions during these webinars? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit easier for us to demo right now in web and also um, for today what we're showing, um, some of the stuff we're showing is only available in web right now, um, but we definitely will be. Um, and uh, there was a question about will you be answering Android interface questions? So yeah, definitely send those along and uh, if we don't answer them today, We'll definitely get to them in the future, the future webinar. Uh, okay, sorry, Tobias, I was it for the questions. So go yeah, ahead. that's great. Um, so the the other thing I wanted to show with the content library is um, on both iOS and Android, um, storage of a material library is really easy to do. But on web, um, we we don't have a way to have like a library of materials that come along with you um, for between projects. So. I'm, I've been using the content library to kind of uh, meet that need. So I've created a file that is just a materials file. I'll go ahead and place that there in the scene. And this just has a couple of default materials that I like to use applied to it. And um, I wanted to cover this for two, two reasons. One, to show that you can kind of create your own library and bring it along with you. And then also to show you how to work with materials and groups right now which is not an ideal situation. It's something we're gonna be polishing in the in future releases, but at least I wanna make sure that you know how to do it. So um, the way that our materials work is very similar to the way undo works. Okay? The material is basically per file, per group. So if I um, come over here to the materials tab and I look at materials that are currently in the sketch, right now it's saying there are none, and that's because these materials are actually inside this group. So if I double click to go into the group, you see all these materials are listed here as in sketch. So um, in this case, it's pretty easy to remedy that, that I'll just select this. I can type in U or go to the context menu and hit the X to ungroup. And as soon as I ungroup, these materials then populate here into the list of in sketch materials. But if I wanted to apply one of these materials onto, say, one of these group objects, I drill down until I'm in this group and I can apply a material and they're not here. So that's the thing that we need to work out is get the UI in place so that you can actually do that, transfer materials. But in the meantime, you can basically grab a material that you want to use, like I'll use this brown, and um, just do a copy. So for me, it's Command C because I'm on a Mac, but Control C works too. And then drill down into that and do a Control V. And as soon as you paste that piece in there, then this material appears. And you can click the paintbrush, come over, double click the object, and it'll paint it for you. And then you can wipe out this sample that you placed there because you don't really need it anymore. So now I've got that piece. Uh, and you can do the same thing for these other ones, Control V and then paintbrush it and double click. And you know, it, once it's there, this is actually another pro tip that I wanted to cover. Once it's there and it's nested, 
there's two ways to get down back down to it. You can double click, double click, and then you're there. Or you can use this group edit tool that's up here on the toolbar. So a lot of times for groups, I'm selecting something, right clicking, and we've got the groups tools here, kind of context driven. But we also have this toolbar um, that allows you to do pretty much the same operations, just kind of in a different order. You don't have to have anything selected before you go into it. So in this case, if I click the edit button and then come over these guys, I'll actually be able to choose which of the nested groups I want to edit. So it can save you the trip. If you've got a, a nest that's seven deep and you don't want to click double click down seven times, this is a fast way to do that um, from the toolbar. So I'll just click that guy, go right to it, double click that one, and delete it. All right, so I've got those materials set. And setting the materials on these other guys is pretty similar. Um, one materials tip I wanted to share is uh, what I set up with this material, um, you can see it over here. If I click to edit this material and go to the bitmap associated with it, you'll see it's just a rectangle with kind of a gray um, fill representing a mullion. And then as soon as you tile that, you get what looks like a curtain wall. And you can adjust the height of this curtain wall element here. So we made the levels 15 feet apart in the model. So I'll set the height to 15 feet and click OK and OK. And um, now when I double click this guy, Control C, go into this group, and I want to paint this box underneath these louvers, that material. So I'll do a Control V and come over to the paintbrush and double click this guy to paint it. And now you can see how that material um, tiled across this and is the right height according to those levels that we had set up. So that's a pretty fun way to get some articulation in your model uh, very inexpensively. Like you don't have to go and model all those different mullions and you can just use the material to do that. Um, so you can basically do the same thing on this volume, control V, paint that guy on, then delete that guy, and uh, so on and so forth along as you go. So um, those are just kind of the tips I wanted to show you in the currently available tools. Uh, I did want to spend some time kind of showing off our new features that will be available. Um, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about the release plan for those and when people will be able to check them out? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, May 14th uh, is our plan for releasing the next version, and that's going to include some of the modeling tools we're going to show today in the free version. And then we'll also be adding a paid subscription option that we uh, mentioned briefly last time that will give some analysis tools as well as the collaboration tool as a paid uh, subscription option. But it's, it's worth noting that we're doing something a little bit different than other Autodesk products, meaning that um, the base modeling tools and format in the web version and the, and the mobile versions will remain free. And the subscription option is a sort of a paid extra that you can um, you can optionally uh, pay for to turn on more advanced analysis and collaboration tools. So keep an eye out, mark your calendars for May 14th. Yeah. Um, and is that about when we're going to be doing the next webinar too? And then, yeah, we'll, we'll be doing a webinar uh, have to send out. It's either going to be that, I think, is the 14th of Friday. I think it is. Uh, it's, either the, it's either the 14th or the 15th. We'll be doing the next webinar. Cool. All right. So, um, yeah, we got some questions last time about advanced geometry tools. And um, it's pretty fun to hear those questions and then know that we were already kind of working on them. So I wanted to... Uh, come into our, our development environment and share some of those with you. Uh, one of the most frequent requests we get is for a, a sweep tool. And um, doing a sweep is in format now is, is pretty much like doing a, a sweep in, um, in uh, Revit and other tools um, where you can basically define uh, a path that you want your, your sweep to follow and then um, give it a profile as well and it'll just kind of move along that. So I'll kind of articulate some sort of edge here using the spline. 
and then draw in uh, 18 feet might be a little big, but we'll see. Um, sort of a fence to go along the side of it. So, uh, oops, that edge doesn't look quite right, right. There we go. All right. So um, under our lightning bolt icon here, we've got a sweep tool. And when you click this, um, we take you kind of step by step through the process that first off, go ahead and select um, either edges for a profile or just a face for a profile. And then after you've done that, um, now go ahead and choose the path that you want to map this piece across. And as soon as I choose that, you can either click the check mark for finish or you can um, hit the, I think the F key is a shortcut for finish. And it will go ahead and sweep that for you along that path. Very nice. Yeah, pretty fast, saves you a lot of time. Um, I don't know how you would do that otherwise. Um, and the, the thing that's too cool is the tool works um, both positive and negative. So if you wanted to have um, an articulation along this roof, uh, you could profile in something like this. Uh, let me give you another tip too. We um, as I keep using the tool, I find that sometimes these editable dimensions kind of get in my way. So I made a request to uh, put in a, a, a shortcut to get rid of them. So that's display dimension. You can just hit DD and turn off the display of dimensions so they kind of go away. And as you're, um, as you're drawing your line, you can click to place it and then still hit the tab key to go in and tell it that you um, actually want that to be uh, two foot. I think that's how it did it, or maybe, oh, I think I put it in the wrong order. So let me do this, start from that midpoint, tab two foot in, there we go. And then um, come up here, tab one foot, and then come over this way, tab one foot, and up. All right, so I've essentially kind of drawn in this roof profile, and so sweep tool works here too. Um, one of the features that we added was a lot of keyboard shortcuts. So for sweep, it's just SW, and you're into the sweep tool. You can choose this face that you want to use as your profile, and you can choose this top face um, that you want to sweep around, and it'll just automatically go ahead and do that sweep for you and remove the geometry that was there. Um, so I find that yeah, just super handy for adding detail. Um, any sort of railings that you would do, I think that example of me doing the railings, or not the railings, but these louvers around the side, would have been a lot easier just to define that L-shaped line and then do a profile um, for them and it would make that a lot easier to do. So the sweep tool is gonna be in there. Um, another pretty frequent request we were getting was um, for a radial array, like, <laughs> I, you just can't really do some things without it. And I think, Tom, you had this request come up when you were doing the Marina Towers in Chicago. And so, yeah, adding this was... Oh, a, yes. It would be that's a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I've um, found myself doing now is, yeah, going... Drafting out a profile, um, something like this. It's almost like the format logo. Why don't I go ahead and add that other F in there? There we go. All right. Um, so now with with anything, I mean, you can do it with a face. You can do it with just edges or with an object. You can right click. And in the array dialog, we have an option to either do a linear array or a radial array. And same kind of thing. You can choose how many you want to have uh, at the end. and whether you want to do a total length. So the trick with this guy is to go ahead and choose um, kind of an, an important, meaningful point, right? Like probably the center or something like that. Do a shift lock so that you can lock the, um, the rotate widget onto the ground and then come off of that a certain distance. Go ahead and click to um, start the, set the center point essentially of your array. And then we give you those same controls that you can go ahead and just pull these off in different directions. And if I type DD, um, I'm going to bring back those dimensions, and I can tell it you know, what angle I want these to be at um, to each other. 
So something like that. And now I've got this radial array and I can do something fancy with the uh, loft tool that we're adding also um, that I can grab a loft, choose these different um, bases in the order that I want them to be lofted through and then go ahead and click the finish button and form it will go ahead and loft between and all of those. So loft is pretty handy in that case, just to connect to different profiles, but um, it, you know, in a radius like that is fine. Um, you could also do that with a sweep too, if you set a circle in the ground and then swept the profile along that. Um, I find loft is pretty good too, like if you wanted to do some sort of awning structure, maybe along this facade, there's those dimensions getting in my way again. So DD, turn them off. Um, do my line coming out this way and then up like so and then out like so. So I just 3D sketched this profile in here. I can um, hover over it, hit tab. It'll select all the connected lines, do a control C and a control V. And I want to paste this guy in over here. Um, in this case, I need to set it down, tab again, grab that corner, and then put it on that corner. And this is pretty cool where I could either, you know, I could grab this edge and just drag it straight up in order to get the different dimensions or different um, movements that I want on this. Or I can like select multiple edges and we, we put in a new tool for this too, um, this sort of multi-move tool, which will allow you to drag multiple edges at the same time. Um, and that's pretty special. We haven't really had that feature in the, in the tool before. So um, go ahead and drag this guy. And yeah, it's kind of doing some funky stuff. I'm not sure what that is. All right, let me try doing this a different way where I just grab this edge, drag him up, and then grab both of these guys. Nope, that won't work. Grab this guy and move him out this way a little bit. And I can also just grab that vertex and drag that vertex out. Um, I do need to be careful about 3D sketching so that, because right now it's inferencing onto the ground. So I need to use shift lock to keep it on this axis. There we go. All right, so now with a couple of profiles, I can go ahead and do the same thing with the loft tool. Grab this guy and then tab to select all those. Um, for, oops, tab to select all those and then click the next button so that it will let me choose the next profile that I want to loft to and then click finish and it will connect the dots essentially for me um, to loft between those two. So that's kind of a simple case, but um, you can do a lot of pretty nice things with loft. Um, so that is some of the advanced geometry tools that we've got in place. Um, I wanted to hit on one of the um, sort of analysis tools that Tom mentioned, and that's the um, solar analysis tool. Um, which you guys have probably seen pictures of um, on our blog and on, on Twitter. Um, this is a pro feature. So when you click it, you go into a particular mode where you're just selecting geometry that you want to edit. So I can, or not edit, I'm sorry, that you want to analyze. So I can do a, a big window to grab all these guys and then probably want to go through and take out some of these trees. Um, so that I'm not analyzing those. So I got to go through and double click to remove those. And oh, come on, go ahead and analyze the trees. <laughs> <laughs> I'll analyze that one right there. And um, then you just click the analyze button and um, Formal will do this right in the browser and it's pretty fast. We have a little progress bar here, but um, this is all the geometry that I had just selected and it gives you results right away. Um, and to me, the best part of this feature is you get this kind of color feedback and you have a gradient that tells you what those are. But if you hover your mouse over one of these faces, you'll start to get feedback about what that BTU is in that particular spot. So, you know, this guy right here, 106 BTUs, but down here, 256 BTUs. So you can really see the impact that that overhang is having on that particular face. Um, and um, there's two pretty big use cases for this. One is kind of doing month to month. Um, so if you wanted to see the impact in June, 
you could do that and then you could slide over and see what the impact is in August. And um, since that rendering data is already cached here, it's, it's fast to update um, for those different months. You know, you can also look and see what the impact is in February or something like that. And you can see how much cooler it is on a lot of these faces. Um, so that really helps with some of the fenestration, like where do you need to have these kind of louvers um, and where, where do you not? Um, the other really powerful use case is to look at solar panel um, feasibility studies. And for that, you probably want to see over the course of the year, which areas are going to get the most sun. And so this is, I think, pretty handy that, you know, right here on these kind of sawtooth skylights, you're getting a pretty high amount of sun up at the top of them. But as you go down further, you kind of lose some efficiency. So you might be better off just putting all your solar panels over here on these angled skylights um, or uh, roofs. And you can see yeah, kind of the impact that this has between this face and this face. So um, yeah, the solar analysis feature is a lot of fun and makes it beautiful. Did you, to, did you point out the um, uh, north arrow too? Oh yeah, totally. So you get a little bit of feedback in here. We turn off the shadows automatically because um, that can be confusing uh, since this is over the course of a year. like. It's not a given point in time. It's it's sort of accumulation. So we wanted you to have some feedback about which way is north and south. So, um, for instance, this north facade where we did these patios, um, this is obviously a lot cooler over here, only picking up you know 400 kilowatts per square meter. Uh, but then the west side of the building is getting a lot more. And then our south side. Should... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just point out that. This is under the hood. The same um, kind of calculations that we're using in, that, we're, that we were using in Vasari and that we use in the Revit add-in that's available on Labs. So we're basically taking the same calculations and uh, using them and exposing them in format in this way. Yeah, yeah. And, and as far as the beautiful picture goes, I mean, there's a few more kind of visual styles we're putting in place, um, and those are all hooked up to keyboard shortcuts as well. So um, being able to come in here and turn on ambient shadows and you can turn off edges but still leave the silhouette edges on um, this is probably my favorite visual style at the moment um, gives you a really nice kind of shaded effect but without too many edges in it and if you jump back into solar analysis that same um, rendering style will be brought across too so again I'll just go ahead and select the whole model and grab these guys too there you go. And then hit Analyze. And you'll see the, the edges are a little bit less dramatic in this rendering. So I, I, one question was about, is it based on time of day or on all day reading? So it's it's based on the peak. Uh, well, both of, well the, if you go back, cumulative is obviously the cumulative for the entire year for that weather station. Month peak will give you the peak reading for that month. Um, we're not. If you want to do a kind of a more fine-grained daily analysis, we're we're, um, we're suggesting people use Revit, the Revit add-in for that. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is just so great. Like you can see the kind of impact that this overhang has on the southern facade there. I think my tree is actually getting in my way. I can't get all the way down there. So actually, this is where a jetpack man comes in pretty handy. <laughs> drop down to first-person perspective. And then uh, let's get there, let's get there, okay. Or a bit up a bit, there you go. And then go into first person, there you go. So now you can kind of see where the impact that that overhang starts to have on your facade. Um, and you can move around and check out your whole model in here too, it's pretty great. Oops, looks like I'm inside my sculpture. There you go. Cool. We should take a couple of snapshots of that. <laughs> yeah. So we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, there was a few other questions I tried to answer them on um, the question pane, but uh, just most of these were about <laughs> features that we don't have yet, but they're working on. So can we customize shortcuts? 
Um, no, not yet. Um, mirror group option, also something we're looking at. Yeah. Um, changing the radius of an array after you made it, no, but um, also something we're looking at. Um, so those are just kind of questions about things that we are, you know, we're way ahead of you on those. <laughs> we're already looking, already looking at them. Yeah. But that's awesome to, to hear the feedback and know that those are needed. Um, because, yeah, we definitely want to shape our backlog of, of work to do based on what you guys need. So keep the feedback coming. Yeah, absolutely. And I learned, I, I find that I learned at least one thing in these webinars. So today I learned that you can do sweep as a negative cut. So that's good. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> you know, one other trick that is that I use all the time, but um, it's kind of hidden, is the tab key. It does a lot of special things in Formit. Uh, and one of them is if you hover over a group, and you hit the tab key, it's going to highlight all the instances of that group. So you can wipe them all out at once or, you know, do something to them. You could actually group all these trees together if you wanted to make them all one group now. So the tab key does a lot for you. Same with these guys. Hover over one of them, hit tab. It'll pre-highlight all of them, and then you can click to do something <laughs> to all of them at once. So it's kind of the right. select all instances from Revit. Okay, well, thank you, Tobias, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. And uh, our next episode will be on May 15th. We will be broadcasting live from the AIA convention. I'll be returning to Atlanta in a couple weeks to um, talk about the new features in more detail. And um, we look forward to having you all there. Spread the word about these webinars, um, and we will post the video probably uh, early next week. And we look forward to seeing all you in May. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Friday. All right. Thanks so much. You Bye. too. Bye-bye.